Hey there, and welcome to your video on topic 5.5, which is irrigation methods, and I've expanded it to include water use in general. Um, so we'll get to it. Uh, first, please make sure that you revisit um, soil salinization and water logging, understand how it works, um, why it's an issue, and how that's related to water use. Um, okay, the Colorado River story on page 380. This is one of those things that you're going to need to kind of just look at on your own, but here's here are the basics. The Colorado River, as you can see, stretches um, pretty much to the Gulf of California, where it then goes out into the Pacific Ocean. The issue is that this is a source of fresh water that cuts through, you can see, one, two, three, four, five states, um, and they all pull some away as it gets th goes through here. Now, all of these, by the way, are dams. We'll talk about what a dam is in a little bit, um, uh, to the point that uh, it really doesn't flow into the Gulf of California anymore. So imagine that entire estuary area there probably is suffering pretty badly as of right now. A couple of implications here are, you know, what about the natural life along this river? Um, what if Colorado and Utah and Arizona use up most of the water before it hits California? Um, you know, is that fair? Uh, who, who decides who gets what water when it's cutting through multiple states? If you think that's bad enough here in the United States, realize that things like the Nile River cut through um, uh, the countries that have no association with each other. Uh, wars over water are very common. Um, so anyway, please make sure that you read this page. Um, I don't know that I can ask a whole lot of multiple choice questions here, but definitely understand um, what's going on here and the implications. Um, aqueducts are basically just ways of carrying uh, uh, water from one place to the next. Uh, that is an actual uh, Roman design. Um, let's see. Revisit the amount of water on Earth that is both fresh and accessible. Um, if you remember, only 3% of the world's water is uh, fresh, and most of that is locked in the ice caps. So not a whole lot of it. Um, available to us. Um, I'm trying to see if there's an actual percentage in here. You know, most most of what covers the earth, the 71% of the earth is covered with water. Most of it is is salt water, and so not available to us. Um, let's see. Note how it's distributed across across the globe. Obviously, it's going to be un, an unequal distribution. You know, you have places that are in the middle of the desert, like most of the um, the Middle East. You know, they don't have, a, don't have a whole lot of fresh water available to them. Um, uh, let's see. So make sure that you read this. You really need to understand why it is that water is a big deal. Um, not uh, drinking water necessarily, but just water in general. Water is part of what makes life on this planet possible. So make sure that you read all of this stuff. This right here, this third bullet point, it takes a large amount of energy to evaporate water because of its attractive forces between its molecules. Um, and then also liquid water changes temperature. Actually, this is the one right here, slowly, because it can store a large amount of heat without a large change in its own temperature. <coughs> Basically, this for those of you who had chemistry, this means that water has a high specific heat. Um, and so who cares? <coughs> Excuse me just a second. Um, that means that um, unlike metal, that you put a little bit of heat in it and it gets screaming hot really fast, if you've ever boiled water to make pasta, you know it takes a heck of a lot longer. That also means that it lets go of heat very slowly, which is why the uh, temperatures on our planet are relatively stable. By that I mean it's not fluctuating by hundreds of degrees every day the way it is in a lot of other planets without water. So that high specific heat is one of the reasons why we have life here. <coughs> um, uh, one of the things they, oh, this right here. If water shrank when it froze, like most things do, that means it would sink, and it means that every winter, lakes would freeze solid and life would not be possible underneath them. Instead, ice floats, and ice acts as an insulatory layer, keeping what's under it warm enough for survival. I mean, my goodness, here in the state of Florida, when there is a sudden uh, freeze, we actually coat oranges with a thin film of water, so that, that freezes and it keeps the plants warm enough to survive. I mean, there's a, peop there's a reason that the Inuit people in Alaska live in igloos. Ice is very insulatory. If you're ever caught out in the snow, um, dig a hole. Uh, you're going to get pretty warm pretty quick in there. 
Um, so again, make sure that you look at all of these properties and understand what they are and why they are important. Um, uh, what is the consequence of atmospheric warming on the water cycle and resulting conditions on Earth? Okay, so uh, back to the amount of fresh water available to us right here. This is a ridiculous amount. Only 0.024% of the planet's enormous water supply is readily available to us as liquid fresh water that we can get to, um, either on the top of the ocean or it's close enough that we can drill down to it. It's, it's unreal. Um, so uh, right here, research indicates that the atmospheric warming is altering the water cycle by evaporating, evaporating more water into the atmosphere. Remember, the warmer the air, the more water it can hold. So eventually that means that wet places will get wetter and dry places will get drier because the wind will blow that water elsewhere. Um, also, uh, water is a greenhouse gas, which then accelerates uh, warming on the planet, making that a positive feedback loop. All right, you need to know some basics about water. And I can't remember if we went over this with the water cycle, so I'm gonna go over it again. Um, let's see, groundwater is water, hey, that's under the ground. Uh, the zone of saturation is everywhere where the water is just soaked, basically. Um, the line between the zone of saturation and then what's called the zone of aeration, where there is no water, is called the water table. Um, that line of where you find water sometimes is right up at the surface. Um, it's one of the reasons why in New Orleans you can't bury people under the ground, in part because uh, the water table is practically right there at the surface of the soil, meaning that the coffins will just pop out of the, um, out of the ground. Um, you have to actually bury people in above ground mausoleums. And then sometimes it's so deep you have to drill for almost a mile to get to it. Please realize that the water table can rise and fall depending on how quickly it recharges versus how quickly we suck it out of there with things like wells. Um, uh, what does that mean? It also means is that water table sinks as we overuse fresh water. We have to keep drilling, drilling, drilling to get to it. Um, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. I already talked about that. And then aquifer is all of the places underground. Um, uh, that zone of saturation basically is, is an aquifer. Um, it's not a bubble of water. It is water kind of, I mean, if you think about like ice, um, a lot of ice in a cup and then the water that's in there, that's kind of what an aquifer is like, except uh, replace the ice with rocks and soil um, and sometimes sand. Uh, how long does it, okay, uh, sorry. How do they recharge, how do aquifers recharge? Rain. Um, define unconfined or di differentiate between unconfined and confined. Unconfined is easy. Um, you can recharge in a lot of areas. Pros are it's easier to recharge. Cons is these are all opportunities for pollution to get in the water. Confined aquifers only, um, again, it's like filling a cup. Um, there's only one small place that it can recharge. Uh, pros are that means that you can really control the amount of pollution that gets in there. The cons are if you don't hit that one space, um, this uh, confined aquifer can go dry um, more quickly. And as we're going to find a little bit later, sometimes when you let these things go dry, things happen that prevent them from ever being filled again. Um, a lot of times, water that is in confined aquifers is hundreds of thousands of years old. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, surface water is everything like lakes and rivers and streams. Um, tie surface water into runoff and watersheds. Um, remember, uh, a watershed is all of the high points around a river, um, and uh, everything that runs through that watershed ends up in the river, and that can eventually, through infiltration, um, end up in our aquifers as well. Remember, there is no OA. What you do in one place is going to impact something else. Um, uh, what is most fresh water used for? Um, and by the way, if I spoke too quickly about groundwater and all that stuff, you can see that um, you can read about it here. Um, da -da 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 -da. Deep aquifer, surface runoff, drainage basin. Okay. I'm just trying to make sure I'm keeping up with where everything is. Um, right here. Worldwide, we use 70% of the fresh water we withdraw. Um, to irrigate crops um, and raise, raise livestock. So number one, we use fresh water for food. Um, number two, we will use it for industry. And then number three, we use it for individual use. 
So um, while it's always good for us to individually make an impact on the amount of water that we use, it's also important that if you really want to cut down on freshwater use, um, you need to be hitting up the big boys, um, especially in agriculture and in, in industry, to kind of insist that they are more responsible with a resource that all of us need. Um, okay. What is most freshwater used for in the United States? It's all right in here. Um, and I'm pointing at something you can't see right now. Sorry about that. So cooling electric power plants, uh, uh, we're gonna talk about that when we get to energy, irrigation, public water supplies, industry, and livestock production. Um, I didn't put this in here, but keep in mind that there is a word called potable. Uh, potable water means drinkable. So if you ever see water that is non-potable and means it's not drinkable, just don't. Um, and then household use is flushing toilets, washing clothes, um, taking showers and running faucets, um, and then leaks. Um, so uh, there are lots of ways we can cut down there and we'll talk about those in class. Um, be able to locate the Nile, Jordan, Yangtze, and Ganges, Ganges rivers on a map. You need to go ahead and, and do that on your own. Um, the Nile and the Jordan are Middle East rivers. Um, uh, full disclosure, Jordan's not one that I'm thinking off of the top of my head. The Yangtze River is in China, and then the Ganges River is the main river that cuts through India. Um, explain what happens to wells as aquifers are used faster than they recharge. Like I said before, you got to dig deeper. You can't afford it, no, you don't get water. Um, think about like your straw when you're uh, drinking your soda. If the soda gets below the level of the straw, you got to push the straw down. Same idea. Um, what is the largest aquifer in the U.S.? Probably hands down one of my favorite words to say. And let's see if it's, shoot, I thought we had a picture in here. Anyway, it's the Ogallala Aquifer. It's uh, O-G-L-A-L-A-L-A, -L -A -L -A, something like that, um, Ogallala. And it is located, did I really jump that far? Oh, here we go. Sorry about that. Ogallala, right here. Um, so it is the largest aquifer in uh, the United States, and it's right here in the Midwest. Um, that means uh, just kind of be familiar with multiple states that are there. Um, let's see. Where is it located? What's happening to this aquifer? Exactly what you might suspect. It's being used faster than it is being recharged. Water that has, in some cases, has been sitting there for millions of years. And, oh, by the way, the, the, the infiltration that goes on, um, all of the, um, just like in your eco columns, all of the sand and the rocks and whatnot that are there, they do help to purify that water as it, as it goes down. Now, there are some things that the rocks and sand can't catch, but for the most part, the water that's in there is, is, is pretty good. Um, so there's water that's been sitting there for a long, long time, and uh, we are pulling it out faster than um, it can be replenished. You can see here in the United States, groundwater is being withdrawn from aquifers on average four times faster than it is being replenished. So here, the Ogallala Aquifer supplies about one-third of all the groundwater used in the United States. That's insane. And also, again, consider that this is also the place where we do most of our um, growing oak crops, because that's where the prairies are. It's obviously very um, conveniently located. So you can see how much faster it's being pumped out than it's being replenished. So what does that tell you? At some point, it's going to run out. Um, subsidence and sinkholes. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, you've got this porous rock that the water is in. And as the, the water is taken away, you now have just pockets of air. So, you know, imagine a sponge, uh, you know, a sponge like this. And uh, when you don't have water supporting this anymore, if you've got anything on top, like, oh, I don't know, cities, eventually it's gonna all get squished flat and then it's not a sponge that bounces back like this, it's rock. So once you break those pockets where the water is, it doesn't bounce back. So um, uh, subsidence is two things. Uh, the first one is uh, what's going on on the surface here. So it is the gradual settling of land over a, um, a draining uh, aquifer that's basically going into what's called overdraft. And the other thing that it does is it makes it uh, subsidence is the end result is you have an aquifer that can't be used ever again. Now, what happens if some of these pockets are really big and um, things break? That's where you have all of a sudden a hole. That's a sinkhole. Um, 
Here in, uh, the, in the uh, state of Florida, we've got something called karst topography. We sit on top of limestone that's very porous. Um, so if we overdraft or there's an old mine or just time um, that wears away at those uh, pockets, uh, you do get those sinkholes here in the state of Florida. So part of the reason why they're kind of happen here a lot is because of the rock that we sit on. Um, let me go ahead and find the page in here that has to do with subsidence right here. Uh, subsidence is a big deal. Um, if you go to some cities in Mexico, as an example, you have some uh, places that have subsided uh, three or four feet at least. Uh, what does that mean? Think about what that means for like the foundations of buildings. Um, now you have buildings that are leaning over and foundations are cracking. Uh, streets are um, buckling. Um, uh, I'll show some pictures in class. Things where lines used to be painted straight are all of a sudden oh, like this. Um, you know, you have roads that were once straight that are now canted like this. So it's not just the, the, the fact that um, uh, your, your aquifer is being turned into basically a, a, a squished rock. Um, it's also that anything that's built on the top, um, you know, ends up all wonky. It, and, and then you can have costs there in terms of repairing your infrastructure. Um, so again, subsidence and um, uh, sinkholes are covered right here in this paragraph. Um, let's see. Um, what can happen to aquifers in coastal areas if the aquifer is overdrafted? Okay, so let's go ahead and think about this. So you have an aquifer right here. And then let's say this white part is the ocean, okay? Um, so there's fresh water in here and this is salt water. Normally, the pressure in here is pretty high, so it keeps the salt out. Now imagine you're pulling this water out. The pressure is lowering here. So now that means that salt water can um, intrude into your aquifer. Once this is tainted with salt, uh, you're done. Uh, you're gonna have to um, perform a purification process, which is very expensive um, if that happens. Um, so saltwater intrusion, remember, is very particular to coastal aquifers that basically um, have some sort of opening to uh, uh, the sea or the ocean or whatever is here. And the reason that the water comes in is because you have pulled so much water out of the aquifer that the pressure has lowered that's keeping the salt water out. And then it, it flows right in. Um, so that starts right here. So you can read about that there. Um, dams and reservoirs, um, okay, so <clears throat> here is a picture of, let me find a better picture of a dam, that one's really hard to kind of take a look at, ah, okay, so here is a dam, so here's what you're looking for, before, this whole thing right here used to be a river, now there's a wall, um, so uh, here's the dam and behind it you have a reservoir so think about what's happening and, and then you have like some holes at the bottom so that this isn't like cresting over so um, uh, normal flow of the river when you put a dam what you're basically doing is conserving the water that's back here so that you can use it for more easily for other purposes um, benefits are this is a place for recreation uh, this is a, a resource for fresh water uh, you're creating a new habitat. Now, what are the downsides? You flooded behind the dam and you're keeping water from flowing farther downstream. So uh, uh, organisms up here that are used to uh, habitat and also people, now they're drowned. Now down here where they're used to having water at a certain level, now it's a lot lower, in some cases gone, you know, they don't have their habitat either. Think about what else this is blocking. There are two things that it blocks. Number one, it blocks the, um, the flow of organic matter, sediment, um, uh, rich decaying matter, so it builds up behind here. Uh, so now you have all of this stuff decaying back here, smells can be terrible, um, and there's nothing here to receive all of those nutrients. And then the stuff downstream that's used to getting it, well, it's not there anymore. And then the other thing that this blocks in both directions um, are um, migrating fish. Um, so they go against a stream, hit the wall, hit the wall, hit the wall, dead. Um, so things called fish ladders have been created, which are, are little areas on either side. I will show you what those look like in class. Side note, the unintended consequence to that is that the bears have figured out, and so now it's like just like a 
a little, uh, if you've ever seen those, those sushi bars where they have just the, the boats of sushi kind of going around and around, it's the same idea. As the bears just sit there, they wait for the salmon to jump up these fish ladders. They're not actual ladders where they're climbing. It's Think about like stairs and then water is flowing down the stairs and the salmon jump up each stair. Well, the bears are sitting there and are like, fantastic, and they grab the fish and eat them. So lots of unintended consequences there. Um, so let me see if I've covered... Uh, we're going to hit dams again when we talk about hydroelectric power because this is also a source of electricity, and we'll get into that later, but just basically understand how this works. Again, flooding upstream, uh, not enough water downstream, uh, blocks the flow of sediment, blocks fish migration. Um, benefits are you now have this reservoir, literally, of water, um, recreational area, um, you know, so it's a, this is a place that you can draw from for human and agricultural use. And then you can also create power, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, how do dams impact estuaries? Well, think about it. Now you're not getting this flow of water downstream or this flow of sediment. And so now, um, remember we talked about estuaries are, are, are nurseries and they're places of high productivity. Well, not anymore because the, the water that they depended on is gone. Now they mostly have the salt water coming in from the ocean and animals that are used to a certain uh, range of tolerance of salt now are getting hit with all this salt and it's not good for them. Also, if it's shallower, it gets warmer. Warm water doesn't hold as much oxygen as cold water does. Um, so you have some fish that die. Um, you're not getting that sediment. Maybe the water is too clear and the animals that normally hide in cloudy water can no longer do that. So just lots and lots of different stuff. Um, all right, Errol C. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about uh, problematic. Um, oh, <laughs> here's a better picture of a dam. There you go. And the nice part about this picture is it talks about um, benefits and drawbacks. So make sure you visit this particular um, graphic. So let me find the arrow C. Okay. So this is in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Those are Eastern European countries. Uh, this is what it looked like in 1976. This is salty, but there are many freshwater rivers that led to this thing. Most of them were diverted or blocked off to the point that they no longer got there anymore. And now, in 2015, this is what the RLC looks like. All of this white stuff, that's nothing but salt. So think about what's going on here. First of all, clearly aquatic habitat gone. But then secondly, the salt blows everywhere. And so remember salinization? Well, now you kind of have it happening in a different way. Um, so that's bad. And now think about all of the humans who depend upon the, uh, the fish stock there for their livelihood and just flat out to eat, gone, 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 gone. Um, this is now a uh, warmer area because bare earth is uh, darker than water. So now you have an area that is warming up faster. So all kinds of super fantastic stuff. But um, go ahead and just read this a little bit better so that you get a better sense of what's, uh, what happened to the Aral Sea because this happened in a place where there weren't any environmental laws to prevent this. And then also, again, you're talking about um, different countries. Um, so, you know, upstream, they're gonna block the river and be like, what? And then downstream, they're like, why are you doing that? And, and you know, it, it's, it's tough to kind of decide who owns the water. All right, desalination is taking salt water and getting enough salt out, well, getting all the salt out of it so that you can use it to drink. There are two main ways to do that. One of them is called, um, uh, distillation and this is just super simple you boil the water produce a steam that is fresh water leaving the salt water behind reverse osmosis is you press salt water really really hard against this membrane that has holes only big enough for water molecules but keeps the salt behind giving you fresh water okay benefits are you can create fresh water in areas where there is no fresh water like the Middle East like um, Sanibel Island here um, close to where we are. The downside is this takes a lot of energy. This is very expensive. And this um, really salty water that is produced is called brine. And there's two problems with it. It's hot. So when it's discharged back into the ocean, it's creating these pockets, this thermal pollution. And fish are very delicate critters. And if the temperature changes too much, too quickly, they die. So you're creating this zone where it's gonna shock them. And then also remember, warm water doesn't hold a lot of oxygen. So it's also a hypoxic zone. 
So there's literally nothing there for the fish to breathe. And then secondly, really, really high levels of salinity. And again, um, fish are very delicate critters. And if they swim into an area that's all of a sudden whew, really salty, again, they die. Um, and that's true of the aquatic plants that live there as well. So um, benefits are that the, it, it kind of relieves pressure from those freshwater um, you know, locations. The downside is lots of energy creates unexpected to me um, forms of pollution, um, both thermal and then the salt. Uh, be able to describe both of these processes pretty well. Um, the paragraphs right here are a good place to go in and get more of that information. Um, uh, water transfer is exactly what it sounds like. It is through uh, usually uh, aqueducts. California is very famous for them. Um, of course, the downside is if you're taking water from one place, then that place kind of is going to need the water at some point. You're, you're kind of messing with the balance of the way that things are to make them the way that you think that they should be. So um, please make sure, again, California is a great case study for this. Do make sure that you read um, these paragraphs in here so that you can um, get a better grip on what's going on. Stuff like this is what makes a great free response question. And while I won't ask you specifics about California, tucking away some of these, of these specifics in the back of your brain gives you information to um, add into uh, NFRQ if they ask you for a specific example of something. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I kind of flipped stuff around. Aral Sea, desalination, water transfer. Sorry about that. Uh, I guess I got so excited about the Aral Sea. Okay, so. Now we're actually getting to the irrigation parts. Um, different types of irrigation. Um, you have flood and furrow, and it's basically exactly what it sounds like. Flood is where you just kind of uh, divert a river and just let it go into your, your cropland. Most of the time you use that for stuff like um, uh, rice and cranberries and things that like really wet soil pretty much all the time. Um, super easy, requires no technology. Of course, the downside is, number one, you're diverting a river, and then number two, um, evaporation rates are real high. Um, uh, furrow is where you dig channels in between your rows of plants. So uh, this is really where water logging and uh, sal soil salinization can happen. All right, um, so this is the least efficient method. Um, then you have something called center pivot, this is where you get those circular fields, and I feel like I just flipped by this page. Don't know if I've gotten there yet or not. Sorry guys, oh, here we go. All of these circles are places where you have center pivot. So what does that mean? It means that you've got a sprinkler system where it's pegged in the middle, and then when you turn it on, it just goes all the way around the fields um, with spray nozzles pretty close to the ground and then following the circular rows of the plants. So this is much more efficient. Of course, the downside is um, inefficient in it uses less water and most of the water that goes into the soil goes to the plants. Downside is technology. So this is going to be expensive. Um, it's, it's, it, there's some upfront costs here that aren't uh, possible for a lot of folks. Drip irrigation is the, the most efficient. This is basically where you take um, uh, these pipes and you they're flexible tubing and you dig it into the ground and they have micro holes in them, so when you turn on the water, they basically sweat water directly onto the roots. Because they're underground, um, they're not even up like this, or under soil, under mulch, it's the most efficient. You're not getting a lot of evaporation. You directly target the roots. Downside again, even more technology. Um, and uh, it's better with perennial plants, plants that go from year to year where you just harvest bits of them and they keep growing. Stuff like corn and stuff where you cut the whole thing down, uh, you run the risk of um, cutting up these pipes. So um, please uh, make sure that you read, um, starting right here, improving irrigation efficiency. This pretty much covers everything that I talked about just now. Um, know which one is most efficient, which one is least efficient, which one requires the least amount of technology, which one uh, requires the most amount of technology. And when I say tech, not only do I mean upfront cost, but it re usually requires fossil fuels to pump all of this stuff. So then you have um, the implication of possibly um, air pollution and stuff like that. Um, okay, LEPA is a special kind of um, uh, uh, sprinkler uh, system 
that is even more efficient than uh, just center pivot. It's called low energy precision application. And basically, it has a computer chip in it, and it pst, it's only when it, pst, when it gets over pst, a plant. So it's not just spray. It's like, oh, there's a plant. Pst, oh, there's a plant. Pst. So it's, it's, and it's very close to the plant. It just barely skims over the top. Um, all right, um, efficiency and cost. What are some uh, alternatives? Okay, so this is really cool. Okay, first of all, you have these things called treadle pumps. So you basically um, dig a well and uh, pop that straw into a aquifer provided you have one, and then you just, uh, like a Stairmaster, back and forth and back and forth, or a uh, elliptical machine, and just pump that water out using human uh, uh, human power as opposed to um, uh, fossil fuels. Um, Something as simple as what's called rainwater harvesting, simply either putting out a bunch of, uh, you guys saw this with the city farm, just a, a bunch of barrels, or uh, having a lot of gutters that run into what's called a cistern, which is a giant uh, depression under, under a town uh, where it just collects the water. So just gather it during the rainy season and then you have it during the dry season. There are even places where they have um, uh, put uh, fog nets where it just uh, the fog condenses on it it runs it it drips into gutters that then run into a cistern under the um, under the surface of the city and then you've got all sorts of other things instead of um, catching more water uh, reduce how much water you use by using drought tolerant plant plants that are native to your environment um, uh, polyculture farming uh, the use of mulch uh, Deep-rooted perennial crops, things that grow from year to year to year, usually have deeper roots, which means they're getting at water that uh, crops with shorter roots can't get to. So kind of a little bit of thinking outside of the box there. Um, uh, using uh, uh, partially treated uh, wastewater to then water crops. Now, of course, there you got to be careful and make sure you're not spreading disease. Um, so, yeah, pros and cons for everything. So please make sure that you read uh, through through here. Um, let's see what else we got. Um, how can farmers reduce water usage? How can you uh, individually reduce it? This is one of those things where you just want to tuck some stuff into the back of your head. These are like free response type answers. So just as you kind of skim through here, uh, tuck uh, one way an industry can reduce water use, uh, one way that agriculture can reduce water use, one way that individuals can reduce water use. Um, and it's everything from using different technology like a low flow water uh, uh, shower head to uh, repairing your leaks on a regular basis. It's amazing how much water we use from leaks we just can't be bothered to fix. Um, here's another way that individuals can um, reduce water usage. Stop having lawns. You don't need them. Do what's called xeriscaping, which is the use of um, natural plants um, that are drought tolerant uh, in your front yard. So think about the things that you're doing. You're reducing water use, you're reducing pesticide and fer fertilizer use, and you're creating a microbiome that uh, organisms can live in. Um, <coughs> and at least to me, from an aesthetic perspective, you are honoring the place that you live in. Your xeriscaping here in Southwest Florida is gonna look different than it does in another place. So it's very uh, typical of where you live. So really ditching lawns would be an outstanding way that the individual could um, uh, reduce their water use. Of course, the downside is a lot of people live in a place with a homeowners association where for whatever reason, uniform green lawns help to enhance property values. So you have to have a certain lawn that's a certain height, trust me on this, and certain types of plants and blah, 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 blah. So um, a lot of uh, reducing our impact on this planet and living in what's called a sustainable fashion, which is to only use um, as many resources as they can naturally replenish themselves is to simply change your, your, your the, the way you think about things. Just because we've never done this before doesn't mean that we can't do this. The only thing that's keeping us from doing this is tradition. That's it. Um, uh, how can countries encourage water conservation? There are always two ways, the carrot and the stick. The carrot is provide incentives. Let's say you do xeriscaping in your front lawn, you get a break on your, um, uh, your homeowner taxes. Or you um, say uh, you can only uh, use water Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then you guys over here can only use it Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and nobody uses it on Sunday, 
And then if you do use water on the wrong day, you get a fine. So you either provide an incentive or you provide um, or you levy a fine. Now, of course, the, the issue with both of these is with the incentive, there's the funding that's involved with that. And then with the fine, the regulation. It's super easy to go, don't do that or else. If there's nobody to provide the or else, uh, what are you going to do? Um, you know, the reason that speeding uh, speed limit signs work on the highway is because there's law enforcement there. Um, well, you know, obviously sometimes. Um, and then lastly, what is gray water and what is it used for? Um, so gray water is, let me find the actual, where it is, the definition. Right, okay, so gray water is um, basically uh, water that has anything in it except for sewage that you can use to do things like directly water plants. Um, there are plenty of uh, uh, places, like uh, there is a mall near where I live called the Gulf Coast Town Center, and they clearly have signs that say um, plants are watered with non-potable gray water. Um, that means that it's like out of your dishwasher it's or, or um, you know, your sink. So it's got, you know, some soap in it, um, uh, not necessarily food particles, but it's it's been used for stuff other than flushing raw sewage, obviously. Um, and so you can clean it up just a little bit and then uh, use it uh, directly um, uh for things like watering plants. Um, wouldn't it be great if, your, if the gray water from your house was connected directly to your sprinkler system, your sprinkler system at your house um, so that you could basically use your water twice? That would be really cool. Um, I'm looking here to see where the official, ah, here it is. This is the official definition of gray water right here. So use water from bathtubs, showers, sinks, dishwashers, and clothes washers. Um, if you recovered and stored it right on the spot, again, uh, you'd be using your water twice. And um, from uh, a cost perspective, you would be cutting your own costs. Guys, I gotta tell you, being environmentally, what's called environmentally friendly or what's called living in a sustainable fashion, more often than not, the only thing that's keeping people from doing it is tradition. And uh, in many cases, you end up saving yourself money. So when you talk about being green, it's not just the environment, it's also your wallet. Um, okay, so that was a whirlwind tour of uh, irrigation and water use in general. I do encourage you to go back and reread the, the passages that I pointed out that I kind of skimmed over. It's a lot, but that's kind of the way that this class is. So um, take the time to go back and look at that stuff, and uh, we'll talk to you later.